So today um, I want to preach about reading your Bible. I want to encourage you guys to read your Bible. I just want to share a few thoughts about the Bible and uh, hopefully it'll encourage you to, to get more into your Bible and, and read it more often. Read it from cover to cover and just get into the practice of reading your Bible uh, regularly uh, rather than just listening to sermons in order to get your doctrine and get what you believe about the Bible. So I'm going to be preaching about reading your Bible. Let's start first in first, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 14. The Bible is obviously a really important book. You know, to some Christian denominations, it's less important, right? To them, what's more important is maybe the social work or it's maybe just church and whatnot. But to us, the Bible really is the foundation of everything we believe and practice. It's the word of the living God. So it's a really important thing to us. It ought to be something that's really important to you. You need to internalize that, hey, we have a book that is God breathed, right? It's the word of God and we're lucky enough to have it. The Bible says here in 2 Timothy 3, 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it means that it's God breathed, because it's God spoken. That's why, it's called, that's why we believe it's God breathed, because God spake all these words of the Bible, right? And holy men of God were um, uh, moved, uh, sp uh, moved as a, uh, were spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Bible says here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it's not just this idea that men were just inspired, like we would say, hey, somebody inspired me to do something else. No, this is saying that it was actually breathed by God through them. And it's profitable, so it's useful, right? It does good for us, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So this really covers everything to do with the Christian life. And, and one way I've heard it that I really like is they say, it teaches you doctrine, so the Bible teaches you what's right. It's for reproof, so it teaches you what is wrong. It's for correction, so it teaches you how to make what is wrong right. And it's for instruction in righteousness. It teaches you how to keep it right, right? So I think that's really good if you think of it that way. It's what's right, it's what's wrong, it's how to make it right, and then it's how to keep it right. That the man of God may be perfect, Throughly furnished, oh, it says thoroughly, it should say throughly in this one. Uh, throughly furnished unto all good works. That the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. So we, we know that we have all the Bible, right? Because all the Bible we need in order to be perfect. How do, we, how do we, if we don't have all the Bible, how can we be truly furnished unto all good works if we don't know what all the good works are in order for us to do? Um, let's continue on. Uh, let's go to Psalm 19, uh, Psalm 119, sorry, verse 1. Now, we talked about singing in music, and remember we said, hey, the longest book in the Bible is a book of Psalms, so singing is very important. But you know, one thing that's interesting is the, the longest book, the longest chapter in the Bible is in the longest book of the Bible, which is Psalms, and this is Psalms 119. And you know what Psalms 119 is about, if you've read it before? It's all about the word of God. It's just verse after verse after verse, praising God's word, talking about God's word, you know, being thankful for God's word. So we'll read, we won't read the whole chapter, but I've picked out just a couple of verses, but I'll read just the first seven uh, verses in Psalm 119 together using the projector here. Because it's interesting here that we see seven different ways that the word of God is referred to in Psalm 119. It says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. So one way that the Bible refers to the word of God is the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimony. So that's another way that the word of God is referred to. And that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity that walk in his ways. So there's a third way the word of God is referred to. Uh, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. So there's another word, fourth word the word of God is referred to. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. So if you think about statutes, it's like another way to talk about law. You know, we make a statutory declaration. It's like a legal statement. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. So there's another word. 
I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. So you see here again and again, it's just talking about it's David here is writing Psalm 119 and he's praising God's word again and again uh, in this psalm. It's, there's a, there are a few verses in the psalm uh, in Psalm 119 that are kind of connected to each other. So it's not actually every single verse mentions a word of God's word, but the whole chapter is about it because they're kind of all linked when you read through them. Now, I won't just scroll down to these, but I just picked out a few that I out of, uh, out of this chapter that I thought sounded really nice. And some of these you'll recognize because uh, a lot of the famous verses about God's word are in Psalm 119. So this is uh, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts. So you see here there's these different words that are getting used, but I believe in the verse, first seven verses uh, we see the, the different words that are used throughout, uh, the, um, throughout the chapter. It says, um, I, will, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Uh, verse 18, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Thy testimonies, verse 24, also are my delight and my counsellors. So you see here we get counsel from the word of God. Verse 27, make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Verse 36, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. So you see how the word of God directs us in the right way, shifts our focus on what is right. Verse 42, so shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. I might just scroll here while I go through these, just so you can see them at the same time. Because I'm just, I'm skipping over. I sort of read through the chapter and chose some that I really like. Uh, verse 45 here, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Verse 46, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Verse 47, and I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Let's skip down to verse 59. 59 here. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Verse 66. I just think some of these verses are great. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. You see how uh, David is saying here, I thank God that I was afflicted because through affliction, I learnt more about God's word. Uh, what are we up to? 71. 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Now put that in perspective. I don't know if you know how much an ounce of gold is worth today. It's funny, I was watching this Mike Di Mark Dice video. And he, was, he, was trying to, he was trying to sell an ounce of gold. Uh, not sell, it was, uh, people had to guess how much an ounce of gold was. And if they guessed within $500, he would give them, you know, within 50%, he said, because he didn't want to give them an idea. Uh, he would give them that ounce of gold. And people were saying like 10 bucks, 50 bucks. So I don't know if you know how much an ounce of gold is, but an ounce of gold today is worth uh, about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600 Australian. I think sometimes it's like seven, goes up to $1,700. So gold is, is really, really valuable. And I don't even know if he's talking about ounces of gold here, but to give you an idea, if he says thousands of gold and silver, and gold is worth $1,000, right? That means thousands of gold is worth millions of dollars, right? Now, most of us wouldn't have millions of dollars here. So when we think of millions of dollars, we think, wow, that's a lot of money, it's very valuable, right? And the Bible's saying here, that's how we should think of God's word. It's like really valuable to us, that it's more valuable than even thousands of gold and silver. Oh, I'll never get through these if I keep stopping. All right, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. What is he saying here? I love God's word so much. That's what I'm always thinking about. That's what the Bible talks about, meditation. It's not just, you know, sitting there, clearing your mind and going, um, right? That's not what the Bible's talking about with meditation. Meditation is when you think on things, right? When you're chewing on God's word, like the Bible refers to God's word as food. And when you chew on it, you're thinking on it, you're meditating on it. David's saying here, like, I love thy law so much. That's, that's all I'm thinking about. That's what I'm thinking about all the time throughout the day. 
Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Talking about guidance. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever, for they are, re they are the rejoicing of my heart. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Verse 115. Depart from me, evil doers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Verse 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Verse 140, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. 165, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So we've heard that verse before, right? That comes from Psalm 119. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. Verse 172, my, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And the last verse, 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. So those are, those are a few. It's about a, a quarter, I think, that I picked out that I just wanted to read that I thought were, were really great. But if you go back in your own time and read through Psalm 119, you can get an idea of David, a man after God's own heart, what he thought about God's word, right? That he, that he thought about it all the time. He praised it. He loved it. He wanted to learn from it. He said, hey, these are my counselors. These are my guide. This is what keeps me from doing evil. That's what the Bible does in the Christian life. But you have to read it in order for it to have that effect. Right? You need to read it, meditate on it, know the Bible, study the Bible in order for it to have this effect in your spiritual life. Why? Because you're going to be walking in the Spirit. You're not going to be walking in the flesh. And then you'll see changes in your life. Now the Word of God, it's needed for spiritual growth, isn't it? When Jesus was tempted in the, gar uh, in the garden here, uh, uh, in the beginning of his ministry, right? When he's in the wilderness, sorry. Uh, and the devil says here, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now Jesus here is quoting Deuteronomy 8, <clears throat> when they're referring to the manna that fell down from heaven, right? And I think we learn some really good things in Deuteronomy 8 about that manna that came down from heaven and where Jesus then is saying this principle that we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word of God. Verse 2, it says here, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Now this verse 2 gives a lot of insight into why God allows suffering, right? Why God allows affliction to happen to a person. I just spoke to a guy that denied the uh, existence of God just out soul winning yesterday. And he just, you know, the first thing that came out of his mouth was, well, there's all this suffering in the world. I mean, so many people say this, right? Because they don't under... They, don't, they make the assumption that a loving God doesn't allow suffering. But here, God says here that hey, he let them go through this suffering these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble them, right? To bring them down. Because often people that don't go through any suffering, when you've, your life is just fine and you've got nothing to worry about, I mean, how much time do you spend in the Bible? How much time do you spend in God's work? No, none. It's when people have trouble. It's when they go through suffering that it humbles them enough to realize that they need God. Right? That everything came from God to begin with. And to prove thee, right? to test, thee, test you, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So it's the people that are away from God, but sometimes it's the people that are serving God too. right? So there's the people that are away from God and sometimes he needs to cause some suffering to bring them back to God. But sometimes there are people serving God and he brings some suffering in their life to say, I'm just testing you to see 
are you going to serve me anyway, even when times are rough? Right? He wants to know. It's because suffering, it's like, it's, like, uh, it's like the hot water of the tea bag, right? They, they, have you ever heard the, the analogy of a tea in hot water? And they say, you know, when you put a tea bag in hot water, it's not the water that creates the flavor of the tea, right? It's not the hot water in that, of that tea that brings out the flavor of the tea. No, no, the flavor of the tea was already in the tea. But when you put the tea back in a hot water situation, then the real flavor of the tea starts to come out into the water. And that analogy I've heard before is describing how God, you know, things, you know, people say money changes people, right? They say suffering changes people. But it's not really that it changed them. You know, it's like suffering and tribulation and persecution or, or humiliation or whatnot, troubling times, it doesn't change you. What it does is it brings out what was inside already. You know, you're like a tea bag in hot water. And this is what God is saying here, is to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. See, when times get rough and you just quit on God, you quit on church, you quit on soul winning, you know, part of the reason why was, you know, God might have been testing you to see, hey, are you really doing it for the right reason? Like, are you really in church for God? You know, but people, you know, have their personal issues and they get out of church. Or, you know, they go door knocking and somebody insults them so they get out of it. And it's like, well, were you doing it for God? Or are you doing it to make yourself feel good? Or are you doing it, you know, to, to just for the friends, other things like that? So people do things for different motivations. And sometimes God has to bring suffering their way to see, hey, are you doing it with the right motive? And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So this is what Jesus is quoting, right? So in the Old Testament, they went through the wilderness. Why? God to prove them. And then he sent them bread from heaven. He actually fed them physically back then. But the whole lesson there was, you know, they didn't have anything. They had to depend on God and that they didn't just live by themselves. God provided for them. And spiritually in the New Testament, it's the same in our spiritual life. We need God's word to grow. If you get away from God's word, if you are not daily eating God's word, you will not grow. You have to live by every word of God. That's the spiritual bread that we have. Let's go to uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 1. It says here, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. See, God wants us to desire his word, desire to learn from his word, because that's what's going to make us grow as baby Christians. And then when we get further in, uh, when we go to Hebrews, we can see here that there is milk and strong meat. So obviously you don't, the, the, you desire the sincere milk of the word. So the easy, easy things to understand when you're a baby Christian, but as you grow, right, you don't, it's like a baby. They're, they're not always eating milk. They're not always just drinking mummy's milk when they're 15, 16, 18 years old. No, you get to the point where you want meat now. You want something to actually chew on that actually provides more sustenance. And the word of God is likened to that. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become some as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So Paul is obviously rebuking uh, the people that he's writing to here in Hebrews, saying, hey, you, you should be at this stage where you can handle strong meat, where you can, you know, learn these doctrines and I can teach you these things. Um, but he's saying here, but, you know, because you're not able to, you, you have to go back to the beginning. You have to, like, learn the milk of the word and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of, of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you see here the link between you have milk of the word, you have strong meat of the word. It's interesting how the word is always referred to, uh, often referred to as food, right? Because it's food for the spirit, it's food for the soul. And as we grow in our faith, we ought to be desiring stronger meat, right? And how do we grow in our faith and desire the strong meat? Because the more we use it, right? The more we use God's word and read God's word, we're going to be growing in our faith. So we talked about, you know, obviously the importance of God's word. Um, you know, uh, we looked at Psalm 119. Uh, we see here that the Bible is needed uh, for spiritual growth. And I just want to cover, I probably won't... Uh, be able to go through all of this because um, I obviously said a lot more than I thought I would. But I just want to uh, go on this last point to encourage you guys to read your Bible is 
Do, do you realize what you have access to with the Bible? Because when we have something that is so easy to access, what happens, right? We often take it for granted, don't we? You know, it's like uh, anything. It's like this church sometimes, you know, like people, you know, when, when there's no church to go to, they really desire to go to a church. But now that there's a church to go to, you know, there's, there's not as much desire in it. So when it comes to the Word of God, you know, we take it for granted because we live in the information age. We live in an age where it's just so easy. We, at the click of a button, we can learn things, we can get information. And we start to take for granted what God has given us. And this is His Word. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, we read about here the wisdom of God, right? And the fact that God has revealed wisdom to us and given us his word. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, if I stop there, often you'll hear this verse quoted about things that we're going to get in heaven. Now, I don't doubt that in heaven there are things that I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man, because we, we don't know everything that's going to happen in heaven. But I don't think this is what this verse is talking about because when we read on, so it says, hey, there are things we haven't heard, there are things we haven't seen, there are things we haven't thought of, that the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But read verse 10, it says here, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So when it's talking about the spirit revealing it, how has it revealed it? Right through his word, right? Because the spirit speaks the words of Jesus Christ, as Jesus said. He won't speak of himself. He will take of mine and show it to you. So the Spirit, like Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. This is how the Spirit reveals things to us. It's through the Word of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man. Uh, where did I go? Knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, look at this, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So we're talking about comparing the word of God here, right? Because we have, we have the word of the Holy Ghost given to us in different books, right? And we can compare spiritual with spiritual, not with man's words. We compare them with God's words, sp comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, I've often heard this preached that it's like, you know, unsaved people can't understand the Word of God. I don't, I don't know whether that's fully 100% true because I, I feel like sometimes when I talk to people that aren't saved, they can understand concepts. Right? They, like, have, you, have you ever talked to an unsaved person? They can understand the concept of, yeah, well, I get what you believe. And they, tell, they explain to you, like, this is what you believe. You believe, believe on Jesus. And, you know, but then they just don't believe that. So I don't know it's whether they can't understand it or whether they, you know, the word no doesn't necessarily there mean understand, but it's like they don't receive it, right? Like the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. It needs to be received by faith. They need to believe in order to receive the word. It says here, neither can he know them. So I know that's often thought of as not understanding them. I just, I'm just not 100% sure because like I said, you know, you speak, and all of you probably have, right? You speak to unsaved people, you know, you, you explain concepts to them. They tend to understand the concept but they don't believe it, right? They're not receiving it. And maybe that's what it means when they don't know it. They, don't have, they don't, haven't actually received the word to know God, to know his word. They just, you know, get the concept. They can just, you know, they have like, some people say just like a head knowledge, right? Um, anyway, just some thought to say when I was reading that passage. Um, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's sort of what I wanted to point out there in this passage is, do you realize what you have in the Bible in the sense that you have the mind of Jesus Christ? Now, I don't know if you've ever had this thought before, but have you ever listened to somebody speak? Or maybe, maybe you respect somebody a lot and you, and, you think about, and, you, and you think to yourself, man, I wish one day I could just sit down with that person and pick their brain. 
right? You ever thought, I just want to pick their brain. Why? Because you don't want to know what's in their mind. You want, to, you want to understand how they think, you know, what's on their mind, all that sort of stuff. And here we have in the Bible, we have the mind of Christ, and yet we don't even take the time to pick it up to pick God's brain, right? We can just read the Word of God and pick God's brain. And, and who are we going to get more wisdom from, right? Somebody in this world or from God himself. So this is what we have to realize, what the Bible is. You know, we take it for granted. You know, obviously we, we know about it but really internalize this to realize, hey, this is what you hold in your hand. Like many people have died trying to get a Bible. Not everyone has access to a Bible. We live in a day and age where we just take it for granted. But know this, to whom much is given, much shall be required. So we are expected of God to do so much more. Why? Because it's so much easier for us, right? We have the information age. We have the Bible at our fingertips. We have technology at our fingertips. But what are you doing for God? Right? But God expects more from you than he did from people in the past because they didn't have everything. Right? They, didn't, they didn't have the revelation that we have today. They don't have a complete Bible that they can hold in their hands, that they can pull up on their device, that they can just search. That's why in Berea, when you read in Acts, they search the scriptures daily. They didn't just like us, we just put in a word and it just shows us all the search results. They literally searched the scriptures daily right? Whether these things were so, actually like reading through these manuscripts. This is what we have. So we're expected to do so much more. I'll show you just a couple, we'll end on these sort of passages here. I've got a few more verses to go to. Uh, Second Peter, yeah, Second Peter, 1 verse 16, <clears throat> just a couple of passages on the Word of God here and just to show that they, they didn't, obviously they didn't have these things and the Bible actually talks about this. But in 2 Peter 1.16, he says here, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What is Peter saying here? He's saying here, hey, we didn't just make up tales. We didn't just make up fables. We actually saw with our own eyes the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty powerful, right? Right? To, for somebody to say, Hey, you know what? I, I, didn't, I didn't just hear it from somebody else. I didn't just make this up. I'm actually an eyewitness. I'm sure many of us in this room have had that thought before where we think, man, I wish I was there. You know, like, I wish I, wish I was there. I, I could see, you know, the things that they saw, you know, that I was an eyewitness. I don't know whether, you know, when we think it through, whether we'd really want that because, you know, maybe if you were there, you would have gone through the things that they had to go through as well. So you got to kind of take the good with the bad. So that's really pretty powerful, right? They're saying, hey, we actually were eyewitnesses. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? So they heard that when Jesus was obviously baptized, but also they, they talking about it here in verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we, when we were with him in the holy mount. So what's Peter saying here? So we were eyewitnesses, meaning we talked and we witnessed Jesus, his power and his resurrection. Not only that, we heard the voice of God in heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Remember the three apostles that went up with him and they saw him transfigured with Moses and Elijah. And then he says here, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They saw this, right? They, they're not hearing about it from other people. They saw this with their own eyes. And look at what he says here in verse 19. But we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you see here, that's how the Spirit teaches us, right? Because the Spirit is the one that is speaking God's word. But what I want you to learn here is we have the word of God. And a lot of us would think, man, I wish I had seen it with my own, my own eyes, right? But we have Peter here say, hey, I saw it with my own eyes. But even more sure than that is the word of prophecy. More sure than that is the word of God which he has in order to read and to know what is true, right? Because why? Because he trusts the word of God even more than something he's seen with his own eyes, right? He, he, I guess, I don't know if he trusts him more, but it's like he, he puts it on a higher pedestal, right? But it is, uh, it's more sure. And you kind of think, more sure than seeing something with your own eyes? You know, more sure than hearing the voice of God out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
This is what they thought of God's word, and we have it in our hands today, right? In our own language, thank God. Uh, let's go to First Peter 1, 6. Show you just a couple of other passages here. Peter says here, uh, Peter writes here, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So the struggles that they're going through. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Why? Because the apostles, they saw Jesus Christ, right? But now they're teaching people that didn't see the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, hey, even these people, even though they didn't see him, they still love him, right? They even, and and with, with, in faith, like we are. That's, that's the situation we find ourselves in, right? Where we did not physically see Jesus, but we're hearing something. Just on that note, um, I kind of learned this from a, a video I watched on by David Wood. But one interesting point he brings up is, you know, a case for the resurrection is that, you know, the apostles, basically what he was saying was, and I find it interesting, is the apostles, they died preaching something that they saw, not just something that they believed. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, because when people say, hey, you know, there's a lot of martyrs, you know, that, that die for all sorts of things. And they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, like Jim Jones, for example, right? People will die for a cult leader. Yeah, but the problem is Jim Jones didn't rise again from the dead, right? Nobody was dying to say Jim Jones rose from the dead. So you have that level of, of following in the sense that people are willing to die when they're conned by somebody. And then you have people are, are willing to die for something that they've been conned by in the sense that they might say, you know, so, you know, people might think of it this way where they say, oh, Jesus rose from the dead, but nobody really saw it. Not even the people that are teaching it. They're just saying that. And then people are dying for that belief of something that they didn't see. That's the sort of thing that we would be in, right? That's, what, that's where our faith lies, where we believe in something that we have heard. We believe it's the word of God. And if we die for that, we're at the sort of that uh, category of witness in the sense. But when it comes to the apostles, see, they didn't die for something that they heard, right? They died for something they saw, right? So if they didn't actually see Jesus Christ, why would they be willing to die for it? Right? Nobody's, nobody's willing to die for something that they didn't actually see. And not only that, it wasn't only one disciple that saw Jesus. It was multiple disciples. So you can't just attribute it to hallucination and things like that because there are multiple people that saw him. So if they're willing to die, not just for something they've heard, but for something they saw, that's a totally different category of martyr. And I just, I just thought that was a really interesting point uh, when we think about you know, people that say, oh, it's just a made-up story and whatnot. And it's like, no, no, pe people, people don't die for things that they actually see, you know, if they didn't actually see it. Uh, they might have got conned by somebody or they conned by somebody, you know, somewhere along the line. But if they actually saw something, it's hard to believe that all of them just, you know, hallucinated or something like that. Anyway, I thought it was an interesting point. Uh, first Peter here, uh, what I want to show you here, who having not seen, uh, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Right, which is, um, you know, obviously we, we, we end up going to heaven, uh, that, that sort of salvation too, because there's salvation in terms of, you know, receiving the Holy Ghost and being sealed unto the day of redemption. But, you know, when you think about it, when our bodies are changed, that's also referred to salvation because it's the salvation of our body, uh, not just the salvation of our soul. If you remember, you know, the end times, he says, look up for your salvation draweth nigh. So it's not that they got saved at that point when Jesus returned. It's that you're already saved spiritually, your soul is saved, but then when Jesus returns, your body will be uh, um, changed in the moment of, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, to get to this, verse 10, he says here, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Look at this. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Oh, that's an interesting point right there where it says here the Spirit of Christ, where obviously the whole, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So what is he saying here, right? He's saying here that the Old Testament prophets right? 
they, they preached on the sufferings of Christ. Like if you think about Isaiah, right? Isaiah 53 is a famous passage where Isaiah is preaching about the sufferings of Christ in the future. Even David as well in, the, in many of the Psalms, he's preaching about the sufferings of Christ in the future. The Bible's saying here that the Spirit of Christ was testifying through them. But what, what's interesting here is it's saying here, they're searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. So they're preaching the sufferings of Christ but at the same time, they're looking back at what they wrote or what they're preaching because they're trying to see from what they what was revealed to them what's going to happen in the future because they don't know. They don't know what we know today. See, we can look back and we have the New Testament, right? And we can read and we can understand the Old Testament prophecies and see, oh, hey, that's talking about Jesus in the New Testament. But the Old Testament prophets didn't have that. So it's like, like Daniel, right? Remember how Daniel's preaching about the end times and then he's like, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> What I'm talking about. He doesn't really know what he's, what he's preaching about, right? And he's praying to God for understanding. This is what this verse is saying. It's saying, hey, they, they preach through the Spirit of Christ, but then they're also wondering, like, what or what manner of time? You know, like, when is Jesus actually going to come? How is he going to come? When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed, to reveal, the Word of God was revealed to them in, this, in that sense where they preached the Word of God, that not unto themselves, but what wasn't revealed is how it should happen, because that's what they're trying to search for, right? But unto us, they did minister the things, because now we have their preaching, it ministers to us, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. Who are those? Those are the apostles, right? And the prophets that came after Jesus Christ. They're preaching to us through the Holy Ghost. And now we can understand what the Old Testament prophets ministered to us because we have a fuller understanding. So the point I'm trying to bring here is, you know, they didn't always have the Bible. We take it for granted that we have the full word of God, but there was many a time in the Old Testament before, even at the time of the apostles, they didn't have all the New Testament, right? That's why they needed the signs and wonders to confirm the word as they were going about and preaching the gospels and the word of God was starting to come together into the New Testament. Now, the last uh, passage I'll go to is just Ephesians 3. And then we'll just talk about a few practical, um, uh, practical tips in terms of reading your Bible. But the Bible says here, just going in line with what I just read to you in 1 Peter 1, it says here, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which has given me to you, would, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. So Paul is saying here that God has given me some wisdom, right? He's given me this revelation. Jesus Christ gave him a revelation in order to, you know, teach the things that he did, right? How that by revelation he made known unto me, Paul, the mystery, right? The things that we didn't know, as I wrote a four in few words. Look at this. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. See, so when we read the Bible, we then understand the revelation and the mysteries that was not known, right, before which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So you see here, there was a time when this information was not known, but now we know it, right? And are we taking it for granted that we have this information, that we don't even take the time to pick it up and read it, right? And oftentimes we'll, we'll, you know, oftentimes we'll spend hours, right, listening to sermons, Right? And I was the same, right? When we're new believers, you spend hours and hours listening to sermons. But yet, if you just picked up the Bible 15 minutes a day, like let's say you just like listen to one less sermon, right? You'd, you'd be able to read you know, 15 minutes a day, you'd read the Bible in a year. If you just listen to one less sermon a day, then you would read the Bible four times in a year. You know, it's, it really doesn't take that much to go through the Bible in a year. And yet, you know, we don't take the time to do that. Why? Because it's harder. It's harder to feed yourself than it is to be fed. It's like when you come to church. It's a lot easier to hear preaching from me, right? Because this is food that's prepared already. And sermons are just, you know, obviously audio sermons are just recorded, right? So you can easily just take that in. But we need to get into the habit of actually reading our Bible so that we know and we're familiar with the Bible so that we can actually judge when we listen to preaching. When you listen to my preaching too, you can actually judge, hey, is this actually right? You know, is this actually correct? What he's saying? Okay, so a couple of practical tips. Um, just to finish off. Uh, one is, you know, how much of the Bible should you read? Now, this just depends on how fast of a reader you are. You know, some people read faster than others. 
Uh, I, I personally think it's reasonable to read through the Bible in a year. That's why we have the church Bible reading schedule. If you didn't know, uh, if you didn't know that, hopefully you do now, but the reason why we seemingly read a random passage every Sunday is because we're reading through the Bible in a year. And if you go on the website, there's a calendar on there and it's got all the different portions of scripture every day that you can read. So you can read along. So if you're reading along, you come to church on Sunday, you can read the passage that you're up to. That was the whole idea. And then other times you can just read, uh, you know, or whatever passages you like. But I definitely recommend just reading through the Bible from beginning to end. Obviously, if you're a new believer, you might start in the New Testament and then, then go through the New Testament, come back to the Old Testament. But the reason why I recommend just reading it through rather than just sitting down with the Bible without any plan and just going, oh, I've just, I've just, you know, some people just sit down and they'll just flick to a book, they'll read a couple of chapters and they'll close it. The reason why I don't recommend that is because it doesn't force you to read every part of the Bible. See, if you don't have just some systematic way of reading through the whole Bible, like you know, obviously you don't have to go Genesis to Revelation in that order. You know, there are reading plans where you can do Genesis and here and there and then whatnot, and then you follow this plan. See, to me, I just I don't need to follow a plan. I just read it through from beginning to end, right? It's just a lot easier. But what it does mean is that I read every part of the Bible, right? I'm always reading through the Bible, even passages that I find hard. I'm always going over it evenly. Because what happens if you don't follow a plan and you just sit down and just read any, uh, any passage? What tends to happen is you tend to gravitate towards the passages that you're more familiar with. You tend to gravitate towards the passages that you like and then you just end up reading those passages more and getting more familiar with those, which is not bad in and of itself. I mean, don't get me wrong. Obviously, that's a good thing too, but it's a little imbalanced, right? You want to learn, you want to also read the passages that you're not so familiar with and force yourself to get familiar with those because the way Bible reading works it's like with anything. The first time you do it and it's unfamiliar to you, you, you you're going to read through the Bible. And trust me, like you'll read through the Bible the first few times and just thinking, what is going on here? I have no idea what I'm reading. But one day when you start familiarizing yourself and you, you know, maybe you're listening to more preaching, you're reading it more, you're reading things several times because through the Bible, stories get repeated. Like when you read through the Psalms, it goes back and refers to Exodus and Deuteronomy referred to Ex the laws in Exodus too. And then, you know, you read through the Bible, it's always referring back to things and cross-referencing and whatnot. So as you read through the Bible, you start to get more familiar with it. And then all of a sudden, one day you'll be reading through a passage that you never understood before. And then the Spirit just starts talking to you in the sense that, wow, I'm actually understanding this. Like, I remember the first time I read through Exodus and I actually understood what was going on. And I was like, oh, I never, I never got this before that this is actually instructions on how the tabernacle looks and how the Ark of the Covenant looks. Because when I read it before, I was like, what, are, what is going on here? Like, what are these staves that are covered with gold and shit and wood and all the different... Is, it, is anyone like... Yeah. Can I get a witness? I don't know. That's, that's how I felt when I was reading through it. I remember when I was a really young Christian like just, just a couple of years in the faith. And, you know, like we, we were, I had no idea what the different epistles were. And then, I, and then I remember one day we were reading the book of Galatians in church and then it just dawned on me that's like, hey, this is actually a letter that's written to somebody else. Like I had no idea because I just, I didn't know that that's what the epistles were. I didn't know what Galatians meant. I didn't know what Ephesians meant. And then it was like, wow, it's, when I'm reading this, I actually get what's going on now. I can actually see that Paul is trying to explain things to another church. And to me, that was just revolutionary, like back then when I was um, growing in the faith. So don't lose heart. You know, when there are passages, my, my point is, there are passages that you're familiar with, that are easy to read. This is the, like the milk of the word. There's the strong meat too, but don't lose heart. Keep trying to read them because you want to get familiar with them. And the more you get familiar with them, the more you're going to realize, hey, wow, I actually, the Spirit's actually teaching me through these. Because oftentimes you'll listen to my preaching, right? You'll listen to the things that I might share with you. And you just think like, oh, how did Victor come up with this? Like, how, did, how does he know these things? Like, how did, how did he find this in the Bible? And it's literally, it's just from reading it. You just read it, you get familiar with it. And, and, and that's where you learn these things because the Spirit is speaking to you, it's teaching you. You're comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the reason why to some people, these are just out of the blue, they don't know because they're not familiar with these passages. Like a lot of these passages people are not familiar with. So then they, they have sort of one view on something, but not a full view. And that just often happens with us um, when, uh, in the Christian life. So that's how much to read. Um, another question is when to read it. When do you read the Bible? You know, is it mandated that you must wake up early in the morning and read it before you go to work or you read it at night? 
Uh, you know, these are just preferences, just so you know, because a lot of people, they don't know, like, is it mandated or not? You know, should I be waking up early in the morning to read my Bible? And obviously some people prefer that. To me, I would just say, hey, read the Bible when you're most attentive. You know, because me personally, I'm not a morning person. You know, if you try and get me to do something, I struggled, get out of bed, get to work, right? I'm so groggy. It takes me a while to just get into the swing of things. But at night is when I'm alert. Like, I'm like a night owl. It's like everyone's going to sleep and it's like now, now I'm like buzzing, right? Trying to like get things done. So to me, I'm a bit more attentive at night. So I personally prefer to read it, you know, before I go to bed. But if you're the sort of person that, you know, you get in bed and you try and read your Bible and then after two seconds you fall asleep, then obviously you shouldn't read your Bible that way. If you know that's going to happen, like don't snuggle into bed, you get comfy, okay, I'm going to read my Bible now, and like two seconds later you're falling, falling asleep. If you know that, then obviously read it at a different time. Read it where you, you're actually attentive. The last thing I'll say is, uh, you know, like some people might say, hey, well, do you need to read it in the book or in a device? Um, you know, personally, I read the, the Bible on my phone before I go to sleep. But for some people, that's not a good thing because, you know, they might get distracted easily. So I see, I see that there are pros and cons to that because, you know, the re the, the, I think the pro in, in reading a, a physical book, uh, one might be, you know, a lot of people don't like the radiation coming from the device and whatnot. It might be easier on the eyes. You know, now they have, I know Lewis has like a Kindle, has like sort of ink thing. Um, but in terms of like using your phone, I know one thing that people struggle with when they're trying to study and they're trying to read their Bible on their phone is that it's very distracting, right? Because then your, your Facebook alerts are coming in and messages are coming in and WhatsApp messages and then it starts to take you away from the Bible. So these are the sort of things you have to keep in mind. But there's really uh, no right and wrong. I can really only tell you what I do. You know, I prefer to read the Bible at night. I read through from beginning to end. And, you know, like, you know, I just read on the phone, you know, because I, I, if I focus on it, I don't have a problem with that. All right, so I hope, I hope you learned something there. I'll end it there, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue with some of the other points next week. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Uh, Lord, help us not to take it for granted what we have uh, in, in uh, the word of God and, and the fact that we have the word of God. So we just pray, uh, Lord, that you would, um, you know, help us to pick up the word of God and uh, Lord, that we would internalize that to whom much is given, much shall be required. Lord, it's so easy for us to study the Bible, search the Bible, read the Bible. Um, so Lord, I pray that with this knowledge and this wisdom you've given us, that Lord, we would do great things for you. Um, we pray and ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.